Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to the 11th session of the critical seerah. We'll be employing inshallah the interdisciplinary approach, the multi-pronged approach in dealing with the life of the most honorable and important and influential man in human history, the most virtuous, impeccably virtuous man in human history, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And today we're going to be delving deep into the more personal uh, kind of relationships of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, uh, in current times, we would say it's not just the most personal, but it's actually also the most controversial, uh, unfortunately, as well. But we need to know, as the Muslim community, as the Muslim people, how to deal with that. And so we're going to be employing the critical approach, uh, and this lesson is going to have uh, that level of criticality in dealing with uh, the marriages of the Prophet. Now, we can't go through all of the marriages of the Prophet in this, uh, in this particular episode, because there were many of them. We've already been through, if you think about it, one of the marriages of the Prophet already, which is the marriage of Khadija radiallahu anha, and how pure that was, and how beautiful that was, and how she was very supportive of him, uh, how she was older than him, in fact, and he was in a monogamous relationship with her for some time. Uh, and then we spoke about how when, he, um, when she died, how that had an impact on him, the year of grief. So we won't be repeating that information, though it is important to preface or preamble that which we're going to be talking about today with that in mind because it will feed into certain narratives which we need to dispel. In particular today, inshallah, we're going to be speaking about three p uh, particular wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first is Sauda bint Zama, uh, who is underreported in some of the narratives uh, when we speak about the wives of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She's not one of the ones that come to mind. I mean, if I went to uh, the street in, I don't know, Whitechapel and ask people to mention who are the wives of the Prophet. I'm pretty sure people will mention Khadija. I'm pretty sure people will mention Aisha. Maybe Hafsa, but uh, Sauda bin Tazama might not even get an honorable mention. But she will today, inshallah. We're going to be speaking about something of the marriage of the Prophet Muhammad with Sauda bin Tazama. And, and then we're going to go to Aisha radiallahu anha. With all the controversies that entails. And of course, we have spoken about this uh, in great length in other episodes and in discussions and debates with interlocutors and polemicists and detractors with the most specious uh, of claims uh, against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which we know full well. In fact, really if we were to ask the question what is one of the most uh, oft-repeated attacks against Islam is to do with the, the age or the union between the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Aisha and how that's reiterated throughout, uh, I would say, this political spectrum, but mostly on the right wing, I, I would say, also. So we're going to be speaking about how to deal with that. And then we're going to be dealing with Safiya bint Huyay, which is particularly p uh, topical uh, in our times because she was ethnically Jewish. And so the discussion about, or discussions that we have about, quote-unquote, anti-Semitism, a lot of it is uh, important vis-a-vis -vis this particular wife, how the Prophet ﷺ interacted with his particular wife. There are some narratives that are relating to how the union took place uh, with obviously another controversial issue, uh, the Banu Quraidha, how they were, or the combatants amongst them, were killed effectively uh, by the Muslim people at that time. And obviously she was uh, spared and so were all the women and children. But that's a product of that particular uh, battle between uh, the Muslims and Banu Quraida. And so this relationship is extremely important as well. Before we continue, you'll see in the uh, third slide that I put there, and there's a list of names. I've got this one, and don't judge me for it, but I got it from Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. But I just, I like it because uh, of, it has a list of names. H having said that, this list is a little bit inaccurate. For example, uh, one of the people that are mentioned in the list is meant to be a list of the names of the Prophet's wives is Maria al Qibtiya. But as we will come to see when we speak about her, maybe in some greater de detail, the majority of scholars don't consider her to be a wife. She was um, actually an indentured servant of some, uh, of some, uh, actually, she was a gift to the Prophet. Uh, she was a gift given, she was an indentured servant, and then she became what you call Umm Walad which is that she had the child of the Prophet ﷺ. Yes, she had effectively the same rights as, as a wife. Umm Walla doesn't have discernible or that many distinguishable rights from a wife. She has very much the same. Maybe some inheritance rights and other things are, are going to be obscured. 
but effectively she has most of the same rights as a wife, but she wouldn't be considered to be the mothers of the believers by the majority of scholars. What is Umar Walid? is a, a, an indentured servant who um, basically had a child with the, uh, the, the Sayyid, or the, the uh, if you want to call it the, uh, the person who's, who, who has the slave or has the indentured servant. This is called a Sayyid. Mm. So that particular person, I mean, the slave, the master, if you like, I mean, put it in a very crass way, the master. So an Umar Walid is, has a different status as would, for example, any particular indentured servant in that particular time. So she graduate, graduated in number, uh, in rank, in that way. Uh, Rayhana bin Tazayd as well. She's mentioned here, but once again, most of the scholars don't consider her to be a wife of the wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Once again, the same kind of situation applied. Uh, uh, this is another, another list. Once again, don't judge me, but from Wikipedia. But this is actually from Zaid al-Ma'ad of Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyyah. Now, that's his list of who were the wives of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So we've got here Khadija, we've got Sauda bin Zama, we've got Aisha bin Abi Bakr. We've got Hafsa bin Umar. We've got Zainab bin Khuzayma, and then we have Umm Salama. And then Zainab bin Jahsh. And then we have Jawairiya bint al-Harith, which we'll speak about as well. We have Umm Habiba, we have Sabiya, uh, Safiya bint Huyay, which we'll speak about today. Um, and then we have Maymuna bint al-Harith and Maria al-Qibtiya. As we mentioned, she's not a wife according to the majority of scholars, but this is the list that is given. Um, something else which I've not mentioned here, actually. There is a there is a hadith which is very and I will mention this hadith first and foremost because it does fit here. But we'll make reference to it when we get to um, Safiya in particular and Juwaidia of uh, a woman. <coughs> her name is uh, Binta Joan or Joniya. They call her Joniya. And actually, this hadith is in Bukhari. It's in the, it's in the most authentic uh, collection of hadith in the Muslim world. And the hadith goes as follows. It goes that the Prophet Muhammad married a woman called Binta Joan. If we don't know much about this woman, but her name is Binta Joan. She's not mentioned in this list. And she's not mentioned in the typical lists. And I'll tell you why she's not mentioned. But he married this woman called Binta Joan. Okay. And when he married her, what happened was that she came into his house and it was time to consummate the marriage. And then she said a phrase, which was a very unusual phrase. She says, A'udhu billah mink. A'udhu billah, mink means like I seek refuge in Allah from you. So as soon as she said this phrase, the Prophet ﷺ told her, you know, irja'i li ahlika, or kama qas He says, go, to, go back to your family. This is, this is the hadith, go back to your family. So no consummation took place. And it wasn't really a marriage in that sense. Now I looked at some of the reports of Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, because obviously he's got Fath al and stuff, where he's discussing these hadith and, and all these kind of things. And one of the theories that he comes along with, I don't know if he really corroborates it with any hard evidence, was that, because the question is, why did she say that? Why, why would she put herself in a position where she's marrying, because she has to give consent. We know that al-bikru to then and these kinds of hadith, we have all these hadith about a woman has to give her, you know, the, the virgin has to give her consent. It's inconceivable, it's inconceivable that a woman would be there in the first place unless she wanted to be there. And we'll come to that, by the way. There's lots of evidence for the fact that the Prophet would never force a woman to be in a marriage that she didn't want to be in. Yes, there's lots of evidence for that. For in the Quran, in fact, itself. I'll just give you one piece of evidence just to, to, to make the point home because I might forget whilst I'm continuing. That there, in Surah Al-Ahzab, in chapter 33 of the Quran, Quran Allah says, uh, in kuntunna turidna al-hayat al-dunya wa zinataha fa You know, oh, mothers of the believers, if you really want the adornment of this world, um, this the hayat dunya wazinata and it's a dormant this world and it's a dormant then come and I will set you free okay and by the way the scholars of Islam said that this was an efficacious verse meaning what it was it was a verse where any of the wives of the prophet at any time could have gone to the prophet and said to him I don't want to be with you anymore and it would have been fine it would have been con considered to be a divorce like for example you know in Islamic law yeah um, a man can divorce a woman by just saying a word. Now, obviously, a woman can go and do fasq and khula and all this kind of stuff. She can ask him, because khula is when she goes and asks the husband himself, I'll give you something. It can be even a pen. I mean, some scholars say, but usually it's the mahar, right? 
It could be something muthmin, something which is khula is something muthmin, something which is has value, but then you give me a talaq. So it's considered to be khula. That's one category of thing, khula. Then you have fasq when she goes to the judge and the and the judge determines that okay these two are not su suitable and he takes her so as fasq. So she yes, the woman can get divorced. It's not like Judaism, especially Orthodox Judaism, where there's no way except through the husband. There's or Catholicism, which once again only until recently they've only started, tried to quote unquote reform the situation. So a woman can get divorced. However, a man can say anti talik and it will become efficacious so long as according to the Hanabila. The Hanbalis, he means it. I mean, the, the niyyah element or the intention element is important because the Hanbalis. Some scholars say even if he doesn't mean it, but that's uh, another view. You know, and there's discussion about what, when does it count, when does it not count, but all it takes is a word. Do you get what I mean? So a man, if you say to your wife, you are divorced, it counts as one of three divorces. If you say it three times, then it counts as she has to go and get another husband and have it, be intimate with him and before she comes to use that these are the rules of divorce and marriage in Islam. Now, effectively, this this verse in the Quran in Surah Al Ahzab, you know, in Kuntunna Turidna Al Hayat Al Dunya, Wa Zinataha Fatalain, Wa Matia Kunna Wa Usarrah Kunna Sarah and Jamila, I will give you provision. And I, by the way, the Quran says that I will let you go a bit like any, I won't just divorce you, or you won't just be let free, you'll be let free in a good way, in a beautiful way. So it's like, by the way, I'm not, there's no grudges here. You're not going to be a social outcast. No, it's going to be fine. No worries. If you don't want to be with me, the Quran makes this clear. Any of the wives of the Prophet, if he doesn't want to be with the Prophet, then what? Then you can leave. To the point where there's a hadith, where the Prophet ﷺ went to Aisha, radiallahu anha, we'll come to this in a second, when he basically told her, think about, go, to your, go to your father before you make a decision. But it would have been as good as a man saying to a wife, you're divorced. Does this make sense? So if a woman said, I don't want to be with you anymore, in that context, it would have been as good as a man saying to a woman, you're divorced. So this is the kind of freedom that was afforded to the wives of the Prophet in relation to, or vis-a-vis, -vis, him being with them or not being with them. Does that make sense? Now, you could say that's a theoretical verse, but what happened in practice? That's why I'm bringing to you the hadith of al jawniyyah in Bukhari. Or bin to Joan, because that hadith of Joniyah, she was there. Now you imagine now, subhanAllah, this hadith is a very powerful hadith. If you really consider it and think about it with care, and you ponder over it with care, because this hadith says the, the following. This woman called the Joniyah, the Prophet married her, okay? Now they're together in the room, and literally, this is the time when the consummation is going to happen. Now, uh, sorry to say, Yanni, say we call it, sorry, I'm, I don't want to be crude about this, but we. If, if a young man gets married to a woman, yes, a young man gets married to a woman and then he, he's there in the situation and they're together by themselves, whatever. And she says some words like, what's the young man going to do? We'll talk about that after. Let's just get, get on with the job. Sorry to say, we'll talk about that after. Or the, you know, whatever, you know. Now, if the person in question is a sex addict, if the person in question has this uh, vociferous, uh, vehemently vociferous, you know, nature where they need to engage in this manner, then halas, this is the opportunity. But he immediately, when he heard, not even, an ex a, not even, by the way, this is not even clear uh, negation. It's not like, I don't want to do this. It's not even that clear. Do you know what I mean? It's not even like that clear. But even this is that you can imply from it, he said, go back to your family. I'm not interested. So this shows you the extent to which the Prophet ﷺ, number one, the self-respect that he had for himself, the self-dignity, but also the control of his sexual faculties that he had, which, by the way, in the first episode, the second, we spoke about the virtues, and Aisha said this, she said that, that he is the best of you in terms of controlling his sexual desire. But it also dispels already the narratives which we're going to come across, which indicate that the Prophet was forcibly, uh, you know, marrying this one or that one. Because if it was about forcing... Then why didn't you force a Jawniyyah? He told her to go back to your family. Now, Ibn Hajar says about this. Why did she say that? So he, some theories he brought forward as some of the other wives of the Prophet said that you know, he likes that. The Prophet, you know, Muhammad likes, he likes the kind of words. She, I mean, it's, maybe she, the idea is Ibn Hajar is saying that Aisha tricked her. 
because she was jealous, effectively. And we're going to come to the jealousy of Aisha. At what point was this marriage taking place? At what point in the prophethood? Are we don't, the Jonia one? Yes. I don't know, to be honest with you. I mean, that's, that's a very... We'll come to the, like, the, the ordering of the... Um, when they married. Like, for example, Sodom and Zama will come to, like, it was the second year of Hijrah. Mm -hmm. so, um, and then same thing with, like, one year later, they say, Aisha got married to the Prophet Muhammad Sallam. But then, don't forget, there's a difference between the marriage and the consummation with Aisha. So that's another thing as well. Uh, in between you had, you know, and then after that you have uh, Hafsa and so on. And so. There is a kind of timeline, but exact dates, I tried to look at this, and there wasn't exact dates. Okay, this is in Bukhari, like mentioned, there's, there's estimations. So where she fit in, where this exactly happened, I don't think you're going to find anything authentic or reliable exactly to, as to where she fit in exactly. We can assume it was a Medinan period, of course, like Annie, we can assume that it was after uh, Sauda and Aisha, for example, but I think more than that would be guessing at that point, you know. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so as we mentioned, I looked at some of the things, and uh, so Sauda went to Zama'a, she married the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam according to Ibn Kathir, in his book, Abdeo uh, Nihaya, on the 10th year of prophethood, and this is the same year as when Aisha married, but then obviously had, had three years because the difference between marriage and consummation with Aisha is important. And we're going to speak about Zainab bin Tajash in the next. I was, I was originally considering speaking about Zainab bin Tajash in this one, but I realized it would be too, too much uh, to, to, to do. So we'll speak about Zainab bin Tajash in the next le in the lesson. So just to go through the first one then, Sauda bin Tizama, who we said. Not many people have, have information about her. The serial narrative relating to her is number one that she, her husband died, okay, and that she was living among the polytheists, and she had actually travelled to uh, Abyssinia. She had travelled to Abyssinia, and the person that she was married to before was Sakran ibn Amr, and according to the serial narratives, they had five kids together. So she had imagine this: the first woman the Prophet Muhammad was going to marry after. Khadija, who was considerably older than him as well, is a woman who was older than him, so Sauda bin Zama was definitely older than the Prophet Muhammad Sallam. And she had five kids. Okay. And I, I came across some, um, some hadith as to what, yani, why this could be the case. All of them are weak, uh, by the looks of it. Or the majority of them are weak. I don't know which ones are strong. But, but though basically, they, there was one particular hadith where the Prophet was approached and he was he was uh, by Khawla bint Hakim and she came to him and she asked him like you seem quite sad right now and he was like yeah I feel like she, she said she proposed that why don't you get married to Sauda bin Zama so yeah he's he was happy with the idea some other narratives in the seerah is like okay well because she was in a difficult situation and her husband died and stuff the Prophet also wanted to offer like a gesture to someone in the community who was finding it difficult so there's both of those kinds of things there. Uh, she was the first... Think about this. Actually, she has a, uh, a distinction, which people don't think about that much, which is that she was the only other woman to be in monogamy with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you consider it. Because you had Khadija, yeah, she was in monogamy. But also Sada was in monogamy. So the two women that were in a monogamous relationship with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were considerably older than him and had previous marriages. In the case of Sada and Zama'a, she had five kids. And he was in a monogamous relationship. So already it shows you something about the character of the Prophet. Because the thing is, if we're talking about what is it that they want to portray about him, they want to say that he was a kind of, you know, uh, sorry to say, Yanni, some kind of a sex addict, some kind of a womanizer. Yeah? That's the most harsh criticism of the Prophet. If it's the case, because he had so many wives, they say, how could a man have that many wives and not be? But the thing is, if you're going to be a, a sex addict or if you're going to be some kind of a womanizer, your testosterone is at its highest anyway when you're about 18 to 25 to 35. So your behavior at that time, we saw his behavior, it was, so, it was open. There was no such thing as halal or haram. Like that wasn't his behavior though. Like we know from that no one has accused him of that. Yeah, and his people in his, in his society didn't accuse him. How come you keep going from woman to woman? He was only with one woman that was older than him. So the idea is, من شاب على شيء شاب على the, the parable, the parable is someone who, who's raised in something is usually... When he's older, he has the same kind of inclination. But if we're talking about something as volatile as sexuality, and we're trying to make the case that the Prophet Muhammad was more volatile 
in his older ages, over 50, than he was when he was younger, when the testosterone was higher. That's a, it's a difficult claim to make on a psychological level. I mean, surely anyone can see this. That's number one. Number two is, even now he is in a situation where he's the leader of a polity. Because someone could argue, to play devil's advocate, well, it's only when he tasted power that he decided to go with all of these things. Well, with all due respect, you didn't need to have power to have what was on the table in Mecca anyways, because a lot of it was payment methods, there was prostitution was there, there was this, there was that. You didn't really need that much power, number one. Number two, when he did have power, why did he go with the woman that was... Uh, first of all, she was a big woman as well. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if you've seen, like we know some of the narrations of Omar ibn al-Khattab when he said that, you know, you can't trick us, we know it's definitely you, yeah? Because after the hijab went on, like she was, she was a big woman. So it's not like, okay, so you're going for a big woman. You go for a woman that's older than you and that has five kids. It's not really what you would go for if you're a womanizer, is it? So it's, it's a very unusual kind of claim. But if you look at the human side of it, if you look at the Sira narrative, it's clear the Prophet ﷺ was very sad, you know? And, you know, this woman came to him and she said to him, you know, this is a woman that wants to get married, blah, blah, blah. So what was the relationship, the question is, with Soda and the Prophet. So what, what kind of personality did she have? We said already she, she, she had experience in marriage, she had kids. But there was a hadith, very interesting, which I came across, and I've put it here. It's basically that they were praying Qiyamul Layl together, yeah? So this is interesting, and we said this already. The Prophet Muhammad would pray Qiyamul Layl with all of his wives, which is an interesting point, yeah? All of them would engage in it, would, it would um, uh, join the Prophet Muhammad in this kind of worship, yeah? And that she was finding it difficult. Like, I think she was bleeding from the nose or something like that. Anyway, they finished the prayer and then she told him about that. And she goes, I was, you know, so tired. And they basically had a laugh about it. The Prophet ﷺ laughed about it with her. She was a kind of joyful. You can see because most of the hadiths, even though a lot of them are weak, I tried to come across the hadith of Zawda and see what kind of a person she was. Most of the hadiths indicate that she was a kind of joker personality, so to say. She was, yeah, she liked to crack a joke. She, she liked to... She was joyful, she was jolly, so much so that some of the hadith with Aisha, and we'll come to this, she, she was effectively saying, like, my favorite wife of the Prophet is Soda. But you'd expect no less from a woman that's very jealous, because obviously she doesn't see her as a threat. I know that sounds like a very crass thing to say, but she saw other, other wives as the Prophet. She was very, extremely jealous, Aisha. You can see what kind of uh, behavior. We'll see when she saw Jawairiya for the first time. She said, Karih to her. I hated her. You know, because she was a very beautiful woman. She didn't say that, oh, you know, I loved her so much. Like she's saying now with Soda. Oh, she's a good one. Huh? She's and that. Because there was jealousy. There was competition. Which we'll come to in a second. The jealousy. And we'll come into what is jealousy. What is romantic jealousy? And what does it mean when the wives of the Prophet show jealousy? What does it indicate? But we'll come to that as a different discussion. So yes, this is Soda bin Tazama, and she had this kind of jolly personality. And one thing that always comes up with talking about Soda is that she gave one of her nights up to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And um, as you can see, there's, there's one hadith here that, that unfortunately the hadith is very weak. Uh, you can read it in your own time. I'm not going to, uh, to mention that. But now we're on uh, slide number nine. So she gave up her day for Aisha, right? She was getting older, she has five kids. Now, I'm going to be a little bit controversial here and say the following. Nowadays, we have like a domestic issue where a lot of men get married to women that have kids already. And I don't want to go into you know, a lot of these ones. But I will say this, I mean, we don't have that many hadiths saying, you know, the Prophet ﷺ went into Soda's house and he was raising her kids. We don't have the, that many hadiths about that. Because nowadays, a, a lot of the narrative is that if a man gets married to a woman with kids, it's almost seen as the epitome of virtue for him to raise the other woman's children. I don't see that if that was so virtuous, why do we not have a... I didn't come across a single narration where the Prophet was there in Soda's house trying to raise her kids and help her out with that. Even though her father was actually uh, uh, dead. Their, their fathers, yani, those kids. However, we do have hadith saying that if you marry a widow, it's a very high you know, reward and there's lots of hadith about marrying the widow and stuff like that. But we don't see that many hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ really like, you know, doing that on a daily basis. But on the, other, on the flip side, we don't see that many, he, he didn't have a problem with it. Because nowadays we have on, uh, many men saying, you know, why should I marry a woman with kids? If it's not my kids. He wasn't averse to it. 
But on the, on the other, there's two extremes. You can be averse to the fact that women with kids marry. And the, the other extreme is, no, you have to raise them like you're their father. And if you don't do that, there's blame on you and there's thing on that. No. Sauda bin Tazama was clever because she realized in order to be competitive, she has to be flexible. She understood her situation. She has five children. She cannot put her, she cannot physically put all of her attention into five children and to the Prophet Muhammad himself. So she gave her day up. Some say, well, because some hadith say that, you know, she feared that the Prophet would divorce her. I tried to find why she came across this fear. And the Prophet didn't tell her, I'm going to divorce you. This is over between me and you. He didn't say, he didn't say that. She just feared it. Why not? Why wouldn't you fear it when you see he's marrying young women like Aisha and this one and that one? It's natural. She, feel, she wants to be competitive. So in order to be competitive, she gave one of her days up. And the Prophet ﷺ accepted this. And this is what some people they call misyar marriage. Misyar marriage, which is allowed in Islam. Misyar means a tanazul an ba'd al That a woman s s uh, steps down from parts of her rights. It's allowed. Misyar is not muta, where the man is trying to get married you see, and then get divorced after two days or, and then they put it in the contract. You see, that's not, that there's a difference. People get these, these words confused. Misyar is when you get married and then, the, you're, for example, if, if it's ta'addud, if it's poly, uh, polygamy, it then uh, it's not an even nights. It's not even nights. This shows you that Islam is trying to create a situation where every type of person can be married and find a spouse. That's what Islam is trying to do. It wants to keep people away from zina. It wants to facilitate all kinds of marriages. You've got polygamy, you've got misyar polygamy, you've got non misyar polygamy. And the asal is non misyar polygamy. In fact, it has to be equal. That's the asal. But some life situations don't allow such a thing. So, Islam has opened the door for something else. You see, yes. When you mean by stepping down from her eyes, do you mean that... Um the wife would see the husband once, one day a week or something like this instead of the whole seven days a week or well, is, is that what you, just an example? As an example, if you have two wives, all right, what would have to happen is that you'd have to split the days, the nights equally, not the days, by the way. Okay. You'd have to split the nights equally, yeah? So you can do that in a, in a multiplicity of different ways. You can do three nights, four nights, four nights, three nights. You can do five, five, whatever. You, you can decide the structure so long as it's even. That's the asal. Whereas misyad now, so a situation happens is that, say one of the wives, say the second wife, for the sake of argument, she comes and says, okay, I, I don't need you to come for all the nights, for all the three nights or four nights, so the, the equal. I, you can come for one night or what, two nights, for the sake of argument. Now, it has to come from her. She has to agree to this. You can't force that upon her. Do you get it? You can't say, okay, well, you have to do that. And what can happen is the following. Like a man can marry a woman. woman and that could be the agreement. And then she can decide, no, I don't want this no more. Now, if she decides, I don't want this no more, all the scholars of Islam says that she has to bring, he has to bring, he has to give her her equal, equal rights. All the scholars of Islam say that. The only way he can get out of that is by divorcing her. Say, I can't, sorry, I can't facilitate and this is going to end the marriage. What about non polygamous marriage? Does that apply with Masyar? I mean, um, what rights would she? She can still give up her rights. She can still, she can every uh, to have like a right what? means you can give it up. So you can say, for example, like in the case of a man and a woman, yeah, and uh, her right is to be given provision, right? She can say, okay, well, I'm gonna give you a bit of, I'm gonna help you out with the daily, with the, with the monthly wages. She can decide to do that. It's, it's, an, it's within a woman's rights to do that. She doesn't need to do that, but it's her decision. So if, for example, you've got two-person household, they're both working, like a man and a woman are working, right? If a man and a woman are working, and they both agreed on that because the, the bills are so high, it should, yani, so long as the woman agreed to that, no one should blame them. And then the question really was, well, what about the housework now? Do you, do you give the woman the double burden or not? Well, if the man is agreeing, to, then there's more flexibility on the issues of housework now. Because if she's doing a role that's not hers, then it's more expected that he does a role that's not his. Etiquette. Do you see what I mean? If your wife is doing a role that's not hers, it's more expected for, for you to do a role that's not yours. But the more you do a role that's yours, the more, the less expected it would be for her to do a role that's not hers. Should be clear. 
So that is the story of Safiya bint Huye. Now we know how she got married, we know her situation, we know that she had a good relationship with the Prophet Muhammad We know some of the con controversies that surround her. Now we've got to go to Aisha radiallahu anha. It's a very important wife. In fact, the most important wife after Khadija. And this, I, before I get to that, um, you can see in the, in the in slides 10 and 11, number, number 10, it's just a hadith on the relationship between Aisha and Soda. And you expect this, like I said before, you expect this to be the case. Why? Because she didn't see her as a threat. And Soda was a very nice like woman, has like a, almost a motherly vibe. There must have been a massive age difference between the two. So why not, you know? We don't even know how old she was. I mean, I tried to find exactly how old she was. I, c I can't find it. Um, so that, that's... Sauda said, Khashit, uh, Khashiyat Sauda, and you saw her Rasulullah Sallallahu She feared that yani, the Prophet Sallallahu would divorce her. So because of that, he said, you know, he knew, she knew that he, pro he loved Aisha the most. That's what she So she said, give, give my day to Aisha. He, she didn't say, give it to any of your wives that you want. By the way, that's very interesting, if you think about it. Because she wanted to save him the headache. Because if she said, give, give, think of the following. If she said, give your night to any of the wives that you like, what problem would that cause? Just fight. He, to choose. he had to choose. And what if he had to choose, then what issues? Jealousy. Yeah, it's just like, why are you choosing her over me? Mm. Now, Musalam is going to come, or Hafsa is going to come, or this one's going to come, or that one's going to come. Whoever she, he's married to is like, no, give it to Aisha in particular, because I know that's where you'd want to go. So he, she kind of, she, which shows the relationship that he had with her, was that he could tell her anything. By the way, Yanni, there's some, Yanni, the idea of disclosing information to your wife, this is a very tricky subject. If you, and to your husband, same thing applies. If your husband or your wife proves incapable, then telling them the information whatever it may be, it could really be detrimental to your marriage. But the more they show that they're capable of handling information, the more that information should be given to them. Because not saying something is not the same as lying about it. By the way, omission is different to lying. And lying itself to the spouse is allowed. But anyways, we'll move on. Because this is a controversial topic. <laughs> <laughs> So, with Aisha radiallahu anha, obviously when I say lying itself is allowed, there's different opinion on that. You know, some say white lie, some say tawriya, some say this, some say that. But the majority opinion that is that is allowed. The, the second thing is that now the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the seerah narrative on Aisha radiallahu anha. Yeah? Number one, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw her in a dream. And he, in fact, he saw this dream twice. And this is mentioned in Bukhari. And basically... She, he, there was a figure and then, and then she, the, the figure was uncovered and he realized that the figure was actually Aisha and then he realized that oh this must happen now there's going to be a marriage that takes place between me and Aisha yeah obviously as you guys know she's the daughter of Abu Bakr Siddiq and in the 21st century standard or to the 21st century standard this is going to be considered a very young marriage and in fact more can be said about that because the consummation, according to Bukhari, happened at nine years old. So what kind of thing is this? They would say, what kind of thing is this? I mean, how can you allow a man that's over the age of 50 to be with a woman that is that age? I mean, how can that cons be considered to be more useful, more impeccable moral and virtue and all these kind of things and say, this is absolutely not impeccable moral. Would you allow that for your daughter? If you had a nine-year-old, would you allow that? You've heard these arguments before, right? But do you know the interesting thing about all of this is that this controversy, if you really look at it and... When I was in, uh, with Ali Dawa and Muhammad Uthman in Salam, we actually done a little bit of a research, Muhammad Uthman, Abu Sophia, we a good book on it. And we've done research, and we realized that this criticism only started to mount in the 19th century. But that, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because if this criticism started to mount only in the 19th century, what does this indicate to us about how humanity, historically and cross-culturally, perceive these kinds of marriages now i want to actually introduce one thing and i'm going to name it a certain thing as well to you guys and i'm going to call it the social construct argument okay now you guys may have seen recently there was this guy matt walsh or 
I think it's Matt Walsh on Daily Wire. And Matt Walsh, he made this thing about what is a woman. He went out and he started asking people what is a, what is a woman. And then he went to the left-wing guys and the postmodernists or I don't know. You guys have seen it, right? And they would say, well, it's not for you and this and that. And they'd make a mockery out of them. And then they'd go to some guy in the African jungle and he said, what is a woman? And he said, like a person with a vagina or... Uh, an adult with a vagina or something, something along those lines or X, X, X chromosomes with that's gone through people, whatever it is, but they would give a biological marker for it. Now, as we said in the beginning of this discussion, if you see where the majority of criticisms come relating to the age of Aisha and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi where do we find them? Within right wing spaces. That's where we find them, really. I don't find, I, I can tell you this as a matter of fact, I find the majority, I'm not saying it doesn't exist in left-wing spaces, but the majority of them is in right-wing spaces. And right-wing spaces are the same spaces you'll find they're making arguments against transgenderism and stuff like that, right? Why? Because they say that you guys don't even know how to define a woman. What, what's the transgender argument? That actually a woman is a social construct, effectively. Whether it's a gender, whether we're defining it as a gender, or whether we're defining it as what, a sex. I mean, Judith Butler says, that Judith Butler, the, the third wave feminist, who props to her, came out in almost, almost in. I mean, I'm not going to say she props to her in this because I don't want to be implicated. But let's just say props to her. She came out as a pro-Palestinian activist and actually had some pro-Hamas things to say. I'm not sure if you come and saw this. <laughs> Judith Butler, this person who's writing about transgenderism. But she says in her book, Gender Troubles, that, you know, she has a book and she, she has many of those, that sex itself could be a social construct. So this is what permeates the left-wing space, this idea that sex is a social construct. Sex itself, like being a woman is a social construct. Some of them say a penis is a social construct. You've heard all these arguments before. Now here's what I'm saying to you. The idea, it's just ridiculous. I mean, most people don't accept this. Yes, most, the majority of the world don't accept this new age religion of the Westerners, right? We don't really accept. The right wings are most vocal about it. However, when it comes to adulthood, they have a very fixed idea of adulthood. But what is that fixed idea? Now, if you look at the dictionary definition of adulthood, is, you'll see a lot of the dictionary definitions actually have the age of 18 in it. They, so, when, when someone says, what is a child? If you go and ask a hundred right-wing people, what is a child? You'd be surprised. I promise you, you're not going to get the same answer. Someone who's 16 is over, 18 and over, 21 and over, this age, this age. Whatever they say, it's going to be a social construct. It's as good as what the left-wing people were saying about what a woman is. Now think about that for a second. What the left-wing people were saying about what a woman is, is what the right-wing people are saying about what an adult is. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because they will say, well, it's a social construct. What a woman is, is a social construct. We, she, it's whatever she feels, whatever she is, and that is a range of different things that make what a woman is. And I'm not here to define what a woman is. You know? so that you'll find the same kind of rhetoric being employed with what an adult is, according to the majority of, let's say, Western peoples. Because if they went for the scientific explanation, then an adult is not somebody who's 18 years old. It's, there's no way. In fact, I've got you some uh, journals, just to be sure. Yeah. Uh, so I've got a definition of what a social con construct is. An idea that has been created and accepted by the people in the society. Right? And an adult is a person that has grown to full size and strength. However, an adult under English law is someone over the age of 18. So you've seen that. This is usually embedded somewhere in the definition. Now, if you look at... Uh, in fact, I'll give you a couple of minutes to read slide 16 and 17. All right? And then, and then uh, summarize it. And, and the point I want to ask you, using slide 16 and 17, yeah? Using slides 16 and 17, I want you to tell me how it is that adult has become a social construct and its biological equivalent. Any questions before we start? Okay, let's, I'll give you what, five minutes? Ten? Five, ten? Five minutes is good, yeah? And then we'll come back and speak about it, inshallah.
Okay, so let's uh, let's feed back then, inshallah. We'll start with uh, with you, Uthman. We'll start with uh, the first source that we looked at together, which is Postman in his book, The Disappearance of Childhood. So, what have you? Um, what does the source say? Um, so, essentially, the source comes to cl- comes to the conclusion that the norm was that there was no definition of a man uh, or like a teenager, for example, that you were literally a child, and then once you well, at a certain age of, they call it the age of reason, seven-ish, uh, for a guy, um, then you're a man. And actually, for you to be a young man wasn't, uh, as as we know today, as like a teenager or in their 20s, it was like 30s, 40s, for example. So there, there wasn't that kind of distinction. They didn't have, for example, primary schools. Um, it mentioned the source that when they went to school at the age of 10, like boarding school, they uh, studied alongside other peoples of a range of different ages. So... The concept that we have as a you know child, teenager, adult didn't exist for, uh, as a source says, many centuries, um, and there actually wasn't a definition in English, the Germanic languages, and also in Latin, French, um, for a young male. So, essentially, it comes to the conclusion that it, it, it's abnormal for us to consider teenagers. There was literally a child and a man, and that was based on reason. Um, your biology. So what do you think then? Let me ask you a question to probe you on the matter, right? So what do you think some of the reasons are that now, if we, especially if we're speaking about the Western context, but certainly if we, even in the international context, I would say Eastern and Western, but more prominently in the West, we have seemingly a very strict definition of what an adult is. What do you think the historical factors which led to this conclusion are? And why do you think we consider an adult to be someone that's, for example, 18 or 16? That's a good question. Um, my opinion, just from hearing mm. that, um, it's probably to do with laws and regulations and just uh, their kind of experience. So, uh, you know, w- how old do you have to be to drive? What well, you have to be an adult to drive? And what, what what's considered an adult? Uh, smoking, drinking alcohol in this country. I think it's just easy saying 18 is the age where you can, you're, you're permitted to do a variety of different actions. Uh, which are considered as an adult. But this is just me just thinking. From no, you're, you're, I think you're definitely on the right track. So I, I want you to kind of expand this as a group, let's expand this and open it to everyone here, which is, to, I want to expand this question, which is that um, we were talking about some of the laws, Tariq, uh, in the past, that, yes. you know, uh, the idea of adulthood, especially vis-a-vis marriage, mm-hmm. was completely different. Can you expand on this point a little bit? Yes, in the laws of England, uh, we have, uh, in 1822... We have a published uh, document from which uh, uh, describes the laws of England and Scotland. Mm. Now, in Scotland, there was no marriageable age. There was no, but it was understood at seven years old, and it's in the document as, as itself. And in England, it was uh, nine years old. So these are actually little, uh, written in the laws of England. Mm, fantastic yeah, point from, from 1822. And yeah, and it's not just England, but it's America as well. You had most of the yeah. states were kind of that age were, were the marriageable age. But let me put something in for you which is that around the beginning of the 20th century so the first early bit of 1900s yes you you had an act the marriage act and this marriage act was an act which changed the marriage age in england at that time it was 12 years old up to 16 okay this is enshrined in british laws you can find it easily and then a lot of the countries that britain had been the colonial master for effectively had changed uh, in lieu with that particular change. What event took place in the early parts of the 20th century which do you think had an impact on this and why? Would you say the world wars? Uh, I don't know, just because I know from the feminist movement, um, World War One, all the men went to war, so yes. the women had to kind of take responsibility of the man's job. So given the... Uh, extra responsibility that they undertook during wartime um, they perhaps uh, advocated for equal rights or better rights or something like this because they were fulfilling the the man's traditional role whereas the man was on the front line at that time that's one thing you're, you're, you're definitely right in 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 citing world war one because world war one obviously as you know t- 1914 1918 took place and these laws took these laws took full form after that time so you find that some of these laws uh, the Marriage Act and stuff was industrial. 1924 and stuff like that. This was after the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution was in the uh, late 1800s yeah. and stuff like that. So now we're, we're past World War One. 
And you're also right to mention first wave feminism because first wave feminism, well, among the things that first wave feminism was advocating, was in fact, um, was in fact, you know, the marriage age to go down for some reason. I mean, for whatever incentive they had for it, they did do that. What we know as well is that the Mar the Marriage Act, or they usually cite like 1918 as the year that women got emancipation in terms of the vote. But that was only women over the age of 35. It took another 10 to 15 years for women at the age of 18 to get the vote, by the way, which is interesting. But the question here is now, uh, the question here is, uh, yeah, so the, the question I want to ask was, why do you think a government would decide, let's open up a little bit, why do you think the government or a government would decide that let's change the age effectively or the idea of when it is to be an adult after World War One in particular? What, let me put it this way, what economic benefit would it have? It's something to do with education. Increased education. So tell me more. Because I'm just thinking the source mentioned that there was no primary schools, for Aha. example. Okay, so now we're talking. So give it, me more. It's, it's a structural method mm. that you can don't use well indoctrinated. That's another topic, but uh, you kind of have a formulated procedure of how you can educate the workforce. Um, so from a child all the way up to a certain age. So the introduction of primary school and the introduction of classes where uh, it's uh, based on uh, gradation. Uh, for example, so I this think idea of gradation and uh, primary school, secondary school, yes. uh, college, university, was it always there? Understood? No, no, no. no okay, no. As, as a we just read. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. Now, once you've put that in place, now that primary school, secondary school, college, university, whatever it may be, right? You've now put this in place. What impact do you think that's going to have? Comparative advantage. So, tell me what you mean by Say that. that again. Comparative advantage. So, so mentioning that. Mm. It benefits economies and it, it lets you compete with other nations. So, th so this is a good point. So he's, he's saying, for example, right, like this uh, this economic idea that came about also in a very similar time period. Uh, he, Adam Smith mentioned it. Uh, Ricardo mentioned it, and others. This idea of comparative advantage. You know that now we need specialists. Okay, and then the specialists can create things, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's inventions. Like, don't forget. We won't have some of the inventions that we have today unless we had specialists who spent years in universities understanding that thing. So you need to have a culture of specialism which can only be brought about through education, right? Pen factory. Say again? Pen factory. Everyone having each job. Yes. Instead of making the pin one. Yeah, yeah, one, yeah, yeah, exactly. Everyone makes a part of the pin and maximizes efficiency. There you have it. So after World War One, why do you think they were thinking in these ways? <clears throat> Yes. No. Now the situation is it wasn't settled after World War One. They knew that anything could happen. You had all these European nations now that we need to be at the top of our game. And rise in America as well. We need to be at the top of our game. We need to have uh, technological advancements. We need to rebuild economically. And the best way of doing that is to have a robust system of education which connects the idea of once you've passed this rite of passage, which is the education system. Then you can be, then you can be called what? An adult. An adult. Do you see? Who so, posits this idea? Is this because I've never, never come across this way of looking at it? Well, this is as you've just because you the reason why I told you to read the the postman source, yeah, is because, in a way, he's indicating this. Yeah. Now he's not going into as much detail, but, in a way. He's indicating this. Adulthood has always been inextricably linked with two or three things. Number one, education. When do you finish education? And when, you, when do you know enough? Mm. Number two, the age of consent. Sexual age of consent. And number three is uh, when you can go to prison. When you can go to prison and serve sentences. In this country, you've got young offenders institutes and stuff like that. But it's these three things. Now, education, I would say, in many ways, is the primary factor. Or it's the thing that, in many ways, yeah. in the West, is, okay, you are an adult when you have finished your education. But is that a scientific measure? No. No. Okay, now, and... It's, it's a pragmatic. It's a pragmatic measure. method. It's, it's something which you can see 
has certain economic impact on the economies of the Western world and the world in general, you can see the benefits of it, why they're doing it. Yes, because the question that was asked in the interim, we said, so if these guys wanted taxation, why don't they just put the kids into the, into the factory, right? If you, if you really just want, if these guys just want money, and you're telling me that adulthood is connected to adulthood is connected to education, so it doesn't make sense because surely having them in the in the workforce from the age of 10, 11, 12, 13 would make them more money. And that's exactly what happened in the Industrial Revolution. And they learned the lessons from the Industrial Revolution. Because we saw from the Industrial Revolution that these kids were getting diseases, contracting this and that. We, we saw all the kinds of problems, the psychological issues. It was There was no long, longevity in it. And in fact, yes, although there was a lot of um, inventions in all these kind of things, it didn't have the economic impact in, in the long run that it that it would uh, a desirable economic impact. Of course, it was a, an important time in history, and the steam engine and these kind of things were there. But there was also a lot. And anyone that studies this would say that there was a lot of a negative thing that happened in the you know diseases and this and that. We don't want to put people in in these environments. But what they found was a better method was to put these youngsters into an education system, and then they can come out and produce the next weapon, or they can come out and produce the next uh, or the find out then you can get the Oppenheimer you wouldn't have an Oppenheimer you know Oppenheimer the guy that the atomic bomb you guys know best about Oppenheimer you're a physicist right you wouldn't have an Oppenheimer if you didn't have a PhD system there's no way this guy's going to find out you wouldn't uh, he was going to come out as an 11 year old and, and start reading books and no it's less likely he needed to be surrounded by the right this Oppenheimer by the wrong people of history I should say not even the right people so, so you can come and produce the, the atomic bomb and, and blow up Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They, they wanted, they needed this. So it was actually in the economic benefit to put a bit more investment, R&D time for these youngsters, then let them graduate a little bit afterwards. Why not? Yeah. And just to confirm, we're not saying this is a, a bad method. We're just saying this method brought the idea of an adult. A we're not, yeah, we're not talking about good or bad here. Yes. We're just we're explaining because just to remind you, right? We started off by saying that the idea of adulthood is what? The idea of adulthood is what? Uh, initially the source, yeah. The no, age no, no. What is the idea of adulthood? What is it? It's, it's what? Maturity. Puberty? Puberty. No, but what is it in the Western... Oh, above a certain age. Something that begins with S. A social A social construct. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so you're, not, you're not paying attention. Or <laughs> you've, got the, you've got the slides. There's not... So the idea of adulthood in the West is what? A social construct. What is a social construct? What's the definition of it? It's You've got idea. it in the slides. It's an idea accepted by people. It's created and accepted. Created and accepted by people. Sure. Okay. So we're trying to explain how it came to be a social, a social construct. We're looking at what you call the historical factors. What time did we? Time it will come up. Yes. So what's the first point we made? The social construct, the, uh, it's the idea that it's made by the people. People, so, okay. Yeah. What's the how do you prove that the idea of adulthood is a social construct? What's the first thing we look at? Look, history. History. history yeah. Excellent. So, and in history, is the idea of adulthood the same or is it different to how it is now? They're very different. Very yeah. different. You just read a source. Who, yeah. who wrote the source? Uh, it's post Postman. Postman. Was it Postman Pat or was it someone else? <laughs> 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 the disappearance of childhood. Oh, excellent. And what's he saying? What's he trying to say? He's basically saying that the idea of a of, of a child mm. is uh, is very different. It's emerged more so now. There was no such thing as uh, there was this is just child and adult. There was yeah. no like young teen or so. Stuff th like this. this gradation and all gradation that kind of things is exactly not, is, is not there. Yeah, they've extended the age of uh, adolescence. yeah. Adolescence. So and then we looked at the economic factors and what yes. did we say? It was in the interest of the Western powers to have this idea of adulthood extended, right? Okay, so you have. Now we're explaining why and yeah. how the social construct of a, an adult began in the 21st, 20th to the 21st century. There's economic factors and there's historical factors. You see? But then if the idea of a social construct or the, the idea of an adult, an 18-year-old adult, effectively, let's just for the sake of argument, called him the 18-year-old adult thesis. If the 18-year-old adult thesis as a social construct, is that a social construct? Then the idea of pedophilia, okay, which, cons which constitutes 
being with someone below this age is also what? A social, social construct. You can't use this social constructed ideas to try and enforce upon me or anybody else what is considered correct morality or not. It's the equivalent of going to me with transgenderism as an idea and telling me that I have to accept whose ever uh, idea of gender is proposing it. So for example, if someone says I'm, I'm a female but they're XY, it, the, the equivalent of you telling me to accept that this person's XX is the equivalent of me accepting that an 18 year old is an adult. It has as much scientific basis. And uh, I was going to ask you, um, Shamir, you've read a source from Putnam. Can you tell me more about the scientific basis element? Yeah, so this is an extract from the journal Nature, which is probably the most um, well-known and famous journal in terms of biology. Um, and this extract states that we have divorced our um, understanding of puberty from our social um, understanding of uh, adulthood mm. and how we have uh, prolonged adole uh, we have prolonged adolescence um, and we have also uh, prolonged the education system mm -hmm. and training and and we have postponed the reproductive um, age to later than what it should be for most people which is sure. below the age of 18. So this goes back into the idea that it's a what? Social it's a social construct. Yeah. How can these people... It, I'm actually quite impressed by it, I have to be honest with you. I'm so impressed that these people have been able to use, especially on the right, a socially constructed idea and make it to us seem like reality. Do you see what I mean? Because let me ask you a question, bro. Now, honestly, and I go back to this point about what is a woman. Yeah, Matt Walsh's famous documentary, What is a Woman?, they were making fun of these people that were saying a woman is whatever the, you know, she defines herself as or her experience and I'm not going to say. They were making fun of these social constructs. Go to the same people and ask them one question. What is an adult? The moment they tell you an age, they give you whatever age they may be, give you. By the way, this is a win-win situation for you. So if you're, if you're speaking to one of these right wings people, yeah, you ask them one question, what's an adult? And I'm not going to move forward until you answer me this one question. What is an adult? Now, let me give you a possible response. They could say an adult is an 18-year-old and above. Say, how do you prove this? That's a legalistic definition. How can... Is this scientific? It's a social construct. It's an arbitrary social construct. And we can explain that it's a social construct. But how do you prove that the 18-year-old is the scientific age? There's no way of proving it scientifically. Okay. They can go the other route and say an adult is someone who is physically and mentally capable that's vague give us what you mean oh uh, muscular skeletal system puberty they'll have to give these kind of things okay the moment you start saying muscular skeletal we are claiming Aisha fulfilled all those conditions and she even says it herself there's hadith that says, she says it herself I fulfilled those conditions okay so it's loose for you so if we start with the question of what is an adult they lose because if they say it's an 18 year old social construct if they say it's huh if they say it's, uh, uh, biological. it's biological, they lose. It's a lose-lose situation. It's like before we, we discussed this and we said there's two ways of... You can have a discussion with them and say, why is it immoral? Is it categorically wrong or is it consequentially wrong? And if they say it's consequentially wrong, they say, why? It's the harm. Then they have to prove the harm. Burden of proof is upon them again. This is another way because this is, these are what we call logical disjunctures. It's a good way of debating. You start with, two, you give them two options, give somebody two options, or maybe even three options. But this is called the process of elimination. It's called an eliminative argument. Because this is, like the Quran does this all the time. It's either we or you are on the truth. That's either us or you that are on truth. On, uh, on the tr true path or misguided. There's only two options. Either we're on the right path or we're not on the right path. Or you create from nothing. It's a disjunctive. That's called a logical disjunctive. So we're just saying the same thing. What's an adult? You've got two options. An adult is an 18-year-old or 16-year-old or 14-year-old or whatever. Okay, if that's an adult, tell me why and I'll prove it scientifically. In the same way as you'd be happy to go to somebody and make fun of them about what is a woman, I want you to prove it to me scientifically that this 18 is the, is the right age. Oh, you can't. You can't, can you? 
And if, it, and if it's 18, ah. then all of these Western worlds, these countries, fall into pedophilia. Because in, the, in, in France it's 15. In UK, sixteen. Yeah, it's in some states of America is fourteen. Yeah. Mm. So now you put all of it. Now you're going to say your whole country is typically pedophilia. But you see, you see how we're starting off with this conversation. Yeah. So what? Because sometimes we do it the other way around. We say, "What is a child?" Yeah. You see the different the problem here. Because yeah. if you start off with asking, "What is a child?" It's not as powerful. Yeah. If you say, "What's a child?" and they say, "Well, this and that and whatever," it's more defensive. Yeah. But if you say, "What is an adult?" Because that's the threshold that we're, we're linking, we're leading to this point of adulthood. We're, we're, we're claiming this point has been reached. So let's tell me what an adult is, because I, uh, my claim is that this point has been reached with Aisha. Your claim is it's not. So tell me what's an adult. Oh, 18 year old. Prove it to me scientifically. Oh, you can't. So it's a social construct. Oh, it's not. Okay, well, so what is it then? An adult is, oh, it has to be biological. Oh, it's been fulfilled. So it's, you either go biology or you go social construct. If it's a social construct, you cannot use a social construct. That's a man-made mythology, fiction. You're using a mythology, a legend, a Western legend, to try and, to try and put my religion down. Just because you and, you and your friends decided it 100 years ago. For the all of humanity, if this was clear as day, as you, your definitions of th this adulthood were so clear, then how could it be cross-culturally in all the, the Africans, the Jamaicans, this one, the, the Native Americans, the Asian, the Indian, all of this, they didn't have, they didn't share your conception for thousands of years. Thousands. It's the first time it's coming up in the last couple, couple of hundred years. If it's painfully obvious, how could it be? It can't be painfully obvious. It's not painfully obvious. That's the problem. That's the problem, you see. It's not, it's not painfully obvious. So you see, this is one of the most contentious objections against Islam and what is it based on spider web arguments arbitrary arguments can you it, wallahi and you can ask Ali Dawa he'll tell you this this is the most repeated objection against Islam probably number one bro number one Akhi. he's been in the Dawa for 10 years he'll tell you would you agree yeah, probably number one number one and, be, and, 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 and this is how, you know, the easiest thing to deal with. If you think about it, just purely, lo take the emotion out of the equation. Take it out. Let's purely logically, it's the easiest thing in the world to deal with. But would you accept this? They, they have to use an emotional argument. They have to. They have to preach to the choir. They have to mention something like that. But if you don't, we're in good uh, standing. Now, there's another argument, so I, the social construct argument, if you want to call it that, is the first thing I want to present to you today about Aisha that I didn't present in that way before, yeah? Well, as Ibn Taymiyyah said, Shaykh, you know, <laughs> He always says, I spoke about this somewhere else, you know? Because <laughs> we've spoken about this Aisha thing a lot, but we have to hit new angles now, otherwise we just, you know, it's, it's going to be repetitive. So that's one new angle, that social construct. Okay, what's the, new ang what's the other new angle? The other, the other new angle, bro, is that I actually had to pay for these, for, for these studies, and <laughs> I pay for the yeah, journals. Okay, you you're not going to get this for free. So, <laughs> <laughs> what, what you're about to see these journals and stuff like that. Well, this one is free, but the next one is not. Um, is the argument I want to make about uh, jealousy? Okay, because look, someone can say, okay, we are talking about Sirah here. So tell me about the relationship between Aisha and the Prophet. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, the relationship between Aisha and the Prophet was that she was extremely jealous and possessive of him. Okay, now. What does jealousy and possessive behavior actually indicate? Love. Love. But, uh, so what are they trying to portray her as? Some kind of a captive, right? Exactly. So she's forced. Okay, now, the first thing I want to produce to you mm. is this connection, which is inextricable and understood by the psychologists as to be a proper connection in what you refer to as romantic love. Mm. Now, it, romantic love is different to any love and romantic jealousy is different to any jealousy. So what I'm proposing to you guys is the following, is that the fact that she, there, is so many, there are so many hadiths, and I'll come across one of them just now, there are so many of them that indicate extreme possessiveness. It shows that she was clearly, she knew what was going to happen, she, she knew what she wanted, and she wanted the Prophet Muhammad more so than anybody else, actually. No one else in the seerah showed as much jealousy and possessiveness as she did. So look at this, for example, right? This is a definition of romantic jealousy, a complex emotion activated by a real perceived threat to the relationship. 
Romantic jealousy is an important phenomenon in public health as it brings consequences for the subject, the couple and the rival even to the point of death. Anyway, it continues. That's, that's one of the one to get like a, a definition. Now, this is a very famous hadith and Ali uses it all the time in his public work of there was a particular woman that came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she, present, she, she was one of his wives and she presented food to him the table and she smashed the, the plate. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Gharat umma, uh, ummukum. That your, your, the, your mother has is, uh, is become jealous. Okay. She smashed the plate. Why are you smashing the plate? Why are you smashing? And the Prophet Sallallahu picked it up and he says, you know, very calm. Shows the mean of the Prophet. It shows the relationship of the wife. And in fact, the Nawawi has a lot to say about this. He says, there's a qadr. There is a portion of jealousy which is acceptable and that the woman will not even be accountable for. But it doesn't mean the woman can do anything. Especially in a polygamous situation. Now everyone accepts that in polygamy, the woman's going to be, especially the first wife, is going to be very jealous. Or the second, there's a third wife in the equation. Because it's the one usually who is the sub, it's like it's been done to her, that the jealousy is more. It doesn't mean the second wife is not going to have as much jealousy. But it's usually the case because jealousy is defined, if you look at it in the Islamic definition of what is jealousy, is karahiyatul uh, musharaka or something like that. So hating to be shared. So there's an idea there, and this, by the way, I've looked at it in the psychological definitions, it's the same thing. Psychological definitions is, you don't like to be shared. Okay, so obviously, who's being shared? The second wife is sharing the first, the, the husband with the first wife. So the, it, the second wife has to be a little bit more pragmatic in the polygamy situation. Like, she can't show more jealousy in the first, and if she does, it's unusual behavior. That's, to be honest with you, because it's the first wife that, you know... And it's the same thing, if a third wife gets into the equation, then the second wife gets it. That's why people say, like one guy came to a sheikh and he asked him in the haram, Mecca. He said to him, my two wives are fighting, what shall I do? He said, get a third. <laughs> because they'll do an alliance against him. You know, and that's true. It's, it's very predictable behavior. Sometimes, you know, the second wife can say all these kinds of things. You know, this and that. And why doesn't she accept the hukm of Allah? And this and that. And the moment the third wife comes to the equation, she becomes a belligerent person. <laughs> You know, it's the hypocrisy. But it's, uh, the idea is don't pre, you know, pretend to be something that you're not. Holier than thou. Y you had to endure something much less than the first one did. And the second one much more than the third one did. And so on and so forth. But we've understood what jealousy is. And it is this hate to be, romantic jealousy is this hate to be shared effectively. Now this is very interesting. And I'll, I'll break this as well. Because I want you to summarize these uh, next couple of... Uh, psychological thing i had to pay money for this for this particular this guy aaron ben ziv i had to pay money to actually get his because <laughs> i wanted to see what he has to say because apparently he's a, but it's, i'll give you one thing that he says this in this very interesting and I, I read this actually in that book that i recommended to you the miseducation of women in the back of the book mm -hmm. he was talking about jealousy studies as well actually uh Tooley. yeah this, james this tooley. james Tooley. he wrote that book and um it's interesting that the patterns of jealousy are different for men or women like, for example, one thing that kept coming up, or you'll see it in the slides here as well, is that when they've done studies on men and women, romantic jealousy, women are more likely to be jealous over a man who loves another woman. But bear this in mind, though. Like, it's a very interesting. You need to know, if you want to be successful in life, you need to know how jealousy operates. Mm. Now, I'm telling you the truth. Whether it's jealousy between friends, between family members, or between wives. Even though you might, alhamdulillah, yani, never ever, do polygamy or anything like this but it's just still important because it's not just the wives by the way it could be the mother-in-law and the wife sometimes the relationship between the mother-in-law and the wife can be like having two wives sometimes even the sister-in-law and the wife can be like that sometimes the two sisters it can be so you have to be able to identify those things really quickly and you see the behavior the possessive behavior if you cannot see that you're going to fail because you don't even know you're going to think it's irrational it's unpredictable behavior. You're going to be like you're in, a, you're in a storm. You don't know what's going on. But if you understand, okay, I understand what's happening here. And you're, if you try and use a hammer to crack open a chestnut, you're going to have all the things in your face. You need to use one of those, what, cr what's that? Nut, cr nut cracker. <laughs> Slow pressures. You have to understand what's going on. Honestly, you know, honestly, why are you going to use a, a hammer? Imagine you have a, a, a thing here. Chestnut. And I get like a big sledgehammer. Start smashing. Start smashing. A stupid guy. Because I'm trying to use, oh, this is a big hammer and this is a... No, you have to know that this is a jealous. 
So, okay, I'm going to use the thing and crack it slowly. Shh, crack, crack it. <laughs> open up and, <laughs> and eat what I need to eat. I'm not going to, you know, don't go against the wave. Okay, so jealousy is what? One of the things is that a woman, as we said in these studies, and you'll see, she's more likely, psychologically speaking, to feel like if you love another woman, that that's, you'll get jealous of this. Yeah. Pound for pound. But the man, if, you, if the woman has done something sexual with another man, okay. he's like, for, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Let's say, case study A. Case study A. Woman marries a man, but she's been with a man before. She was with a man before and now she's marrying you, yeah? But she's still in love with that guy. A little bit. Maybe she has some feelings for him. Maybe she's not in love, but okay. Some, man, some men will manage this. Say, okay, you know what? So long as she's not chatting to him, she's not talking to him, I can, I can deal with this situation. It's, it's manageable for some men. Some men will be like, no, forget this, man. You're out of my life. You're done. But compare situation A with situation B. The woman is talking to another man and she's been doing sexual contact with another man. There's no comparison between two, right? Yeah. Situation A, you can, you can imagine. But even if you remove religion from the equation, situation two is um, no one can tolerate this. No one can tolerate this. The, the man is not going to tolerate this behavior. Yeah? As if you flip it over, uh, uh, honey, and the woman, you have two situations. She, she is in love. Sorry, the, the man is in love with another woman. He's still in love with her. She might be, she cannot tolerate that. She might not be able to tolerate that. But if you had sex with another, I don't know, I, don't know why I just switched it to the second person. <laughs> but if a man had sex with another woman, okay, it's not as severe for her. Now, obviously, there's exceptions and they can't generalize and this and that. And I don't know what the comments are going to say, but I'm just saying that these are the psychological studies. <laughs> That's what the studies show, that the sexual infidelity for a man is much worse. And for a woman, the romantic infidelity is much worse. Once you know that, yeah, it's much better to know that. <laughs> it's much better to know that. <laughs> it's, it's, no, it's important to know that as a man. It's been very important. It's, yeah, I'm not going to go into detail. But what I want to do is, in the um, interim, we'll just read the, the three slides and we'll do the same thing. We'll look at the, um, we'll summarize it and then we'll go into the last bit of the session, which we'll go to the book about Safiya bin Tuhay and we'll end it uh, with that, inshallah. Any questions before we proceed? No, okay. All right, Bismillah ar rahim let's come back. Uh, I'll start with you, Shamir. Uh, tell me some of the things that you've uh, read there from. First of all, who's the, who's the person who wrote this? It's uh, Juan Carlos Sierra from the University of Granada. Okay, Spain. that's one. And the other one is Aaron, uh, what's his name? Uh, I haven't read that. ZV? Oh. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one, but um, this study yep. compares 230 previous studies as of uh, 2016. Um, and basically classifies what are the reasons for uh, romantic jealousy. And he categorizes the reasons as three. So the first one is personal variables. Mm. The second one is interpersonal variables. And the third one is socio-cultural variables. So personal variables are like differences in sex, uh, sexual orientation, um, self-esteem, etc. The interpersonal variables are love and satisfaction and violence. And the social cultural variables are the uh, transcultural comparisons and features of the rival and social networks. This okay, is a bit of jargon. What about the other slides now? So that's yeah, him. that's the abstract. Okay. So yeah, so he he or she or he says that uh, jealousy is not simply losing is is not not simply the fear of losing the other person. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's it's not as simple as that. Um, and because most people do not consider the person to be their property. Um, and they also compare uh, the romantic love to the uh, parental love. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the parental love, you consider the person to be an extension of yourself. Mm -hmm. So you know how people say, uh, my other half, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So that's similar to uh, your parental love. Mm -hmm. However, the distinction that he makes between parental love mm -hmm. and romantic love mm -hmm. is the idea of exclusivity. Mm -hmm. So the other person, when you're in love with someone, you expect them to be exclusive to you. Mm -hmm. So this idea when you're talking about Aisha, 
and the jealousy started to kick in when he wasn't exclusive to her anymore. Mm-hmm. So that is one of the main factors that he says um, that drives uh, jealousy in a romantic setting. If you look at the slide number, uh, I think what, what number is the uh, this guy's slides? I think it's number 18. 22, right? 18. Definition of romantic jealousy. No, I'm I'm here. I'm going. I'm fast forwarding into 22. Okay. Okay. Actually, sorry, 23. Yeah, page 23. Jealousy and love. Mm-hmm. Uh, Arthur, can you read out the whole slide for me? I'll tell you when to stop. Um, jealousy is frequently interpreted as a sign of caring and love, and many instances show a positive correlation between jealousy and romantic love. Like love, jealousy typically presupposes some type of commitment underlying the relationship, and it cannot arise if our attitude is utter indifference. The characteristics underlying our love are those that we most fear to lose, and they are thus at, at the basic of our jealousy. Basis, yeah. mm-hmm. um, in this sense, it has been claimed that jealousy is the shadow of love. Thus, a woman who fell in love with her husband because he made her the centre of his world, or because he made her finally come home, will be most jealous if these aspects begin to disappear when her relationship with her spouse is undermined by another person and she begins to feel insecure, abandoned and alone. Okay, that's it. Tell me what do you think, how do we, com- well, what do you think this, um, knowing that, right, how does this apply to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Aisha? What we're, t- what we're trying to prove here, what we're trying to show? That, um, Go on. That her, their, their relationship is evident that there was no coercion uh-huh. or, or that, that she did not want to be in it because uh-huh. in this argument we make a lot of arguments but we, we never let Aisha's life with the Prophet speak uh-huh. for itself uh-huh. yeah. so tell us can we expand on this a little bit do, do, do you what, what, is, what is a common narrative that let's say the right wing that you've interacted with and others would want to try and put that, that what kind of relationship was this that it was a, 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 a power dynamic that, that you know the prophet he was uh, oppressive to uh, Aisha and that it was one way it was forceful uh, he made her do acts uh, against her will for example whereas what what it's self-evident based on our sources and what's written here that she was uh, jealous in in a in a positive way in a way that showed that she had immense love and affection for the prophet meaning that it wasn't this way it was mutual in fact maybe it was one sided from her side um, when the prophet um, you know had many different wives and she wanted uh, to have as much attention as 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 can be so that's how what did you read about jealousy here and love um that jealousy is a sign of love uh-huh. let me tell you something I mean this is just one source but I think many people would agree romantic jealousy is the number one way number one which you can tell someone loves you in a romantic way wow. there's, there's, no, there's no other better way of mm. finding that out yeah. True. if you think about it I mean it, w- think about how someone can express their love to you mm. if for example and this is the catch 22 for us brothers right Let's say, for example, you get a second wife. Inshallah. Yeah. <laughs> and your wife is like, okay, no, whatever, man. She's completely indifferent. That may be, an, indica- like. may be an indication that she didn't actually yeah. love you, to be honest. If there's no reaction whatsoever, this is a real problem. It's, like, it's a bit more worry. Yeah, it's like, what oh, the hell, what's, going, what's going on here? If you get a second wife and your wife isn't, she's okay with it, mm. I'll, I'll cancel the whole procedure automatically <laughs> because it shows automatically hmm. that bro that's 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 crazy it's hmm. like she's looking for especially for a woman else, yeah okay it's in their blood it. like you should never if, if she smashes the place say yeah. alhamdulillah this is perfect <laughs> no uh, see th- there are obviously you know <laughs> things we have to <laughs> smash the place is haram <laughs> but <laughs> so, so, you know you know allow this but what i was going to say was um at the end of the day it's it's a very but then so now, why, as, as Muslims, we're saying the narrative that we're putting forward is that not only does she want to be there, because we've shown two things already today, that the Prophet Sallallahu gave her an option to leave. Okay, remember that one. We said that, the, were, you, were you hearing that when we said the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave her an option to leave, and that he had been to Joan, the woman that he married, and then she said, and then he left her, straight yes. away straight away told her to go yes. to that family, yes. right? So we gave these evidences, and we showed, so you've got two aspects here. He gave her an option to leave, A. And B, she showed extreme jealousy. Showed who? Gave who an option to leave? All of the wives of the Prophet. Are you talking about when he divo- was going to divorce them or divorce them all? Yeah, he gave them an option, all of them to leave. Yeah. 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 So, so you've got two things here 
which completely disrupt this idea, you see, that, okay, well, he's, it's a coercive relationship. It's a manipulative relationship. That he was getting her to do things that she didn't want to do. That this was a kind of puppeteering and he was some kind of ventriloquist and this and that. And it was making... No, it wasn't that kind of relationship. So the Sira indicates that this was a love relationship. That there was, there was symmetrical love. That was love. When the Prophet was asked about how he, who's the person you love the most, what did he say? Aisha. Yeah. He said, he mentioned her and then he said after her, who? He said, her father. So, and, you know, her father... Khadija, mm. sorry, sorry, mm. I thought it was Khadija. No, he loved the no most. I mean, obviously she was not alive at the time, so okay. he probably assumed of the people that were alive. Mm. And, she, and yeah, obviously jealousy, we saw... Jealousy from the angle, if we look at Yusuf alayhi salam and his brothers, you can see what the jealousy from a brother's angle done as well, where they plotted to get rid of him, mm. just to have the father's love. So it shows why it's so important, jealousy factor and love mm. is, is a but great symbol. But we've got a difference between jealousy and envy, yeah. and, and obviously this um, idea of... You can want something somebody else has, but if you want them not to have it, now it's izalat and ni'mah. It becomes very corrosive. Yeah, it's hasad, hasad now at this hasad, point, yeah. you know. Obviously, Al Ghazali has a whole thing about this uh, in Ihya al Muddin. Very interesting how he breaks that down if someone wants to read that. Okay, now we're going to go on to the final wife of the Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We've already indicated uh, some of the things here. We've just to summarize this point, what did we say? Because this might come up in a lot of the discussions that you guys are going to have about Islam. There are two arguments that we've already made, okay, and I haven't mentioned the ethical arguments that we've spoken about before in other lessons because we've spoken about it at quite considerable length. But there's two arguments that we made today. Number one argument was what? Social construct. Co social construct. That adulthood, it really, according to them, is a social construct. And for them to use a social construct to try and attack something on an objective level is fallacious. Simple as that. That's A. B, we said in order to combat this idea that this was a co co coercive relationship or a manipulative relationship, we said what? It was je jealous and love. She had possessive jealousy and clear love. But the jealousy is the best evidence of the, of the love. And we've shown that in romantic relationships, jealousy is, is a clear indication of love, right? So this dispels the historical, a historical point that this was some kind of a manipulative relationship and there was a power dynamic that was being abused and all these kind of things. Now we move on to another question, or another wife, which is Safiya bint Huyay. Now we will cover, obviously, Quraidha, Banu Quraidha. There were three main tribes of the Jews. There was Banu Abdir, Banu Qainuqa, and Banu Quraidha. And this Banu Quraidha is the most controversial of all three of them. And we'll speak about this in greater detail. And potentially, and we spoke about controversies today, the most controversial, up there in the top three events at the time of the Prophet, in our times, especially with anti-Semitism on the rise and say, look, your prophet killed all these people in Banu Quraitha, he killed 600 people, you know, which is not exactly what happened anyway, because there was a pact, and we'll speak about this more, between the prophet and the Jews, which we spoke, we spoke about in the two lessons prior, and they went against, or this particular tribe of the Jews, not all of them, I mean, there were different things that happened to different tribes, but this particular tribe of the Jews went against the pact, they attacked, and even, by the way, Karen Armstrong mentions this, in her book, she, got, she people that are non-Muslim acknowledge that this was something which was a military operation, which this particular tribe, Banu Qaynuqa, sorry, Banu Qulayda, that they uh, joined the pagans in one particular battle, which we're going to speak about in more detail, called Battle of Ahzab. And so what happened was that they were treacherous to the original constitution. They came in and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he let Sa'ad uh, Sa ibn Mu'ayyad, I think it was, determine their fate. He was, the, he was the judge. And the judgment was all of the combatants amongst them, all the male combatants, that they would be killed. They would be uh, yani, killed, uh, killed off. Now, if you look at what's happening with Hamas and with Israel today, this is not the... Uh, SubhanAllah, I mean, uh, the same people that will criticize Islam, which we've had enough of now, we're done with this nonsense. The same people are justifying not the killing of men. And combatant men with weapons. They're, they are justifying the killing of babies. <laughs> do, do you see? They will tell you Islam and your prophet was this and that. The, the most controversial thing in, in military terms that you can even bring out against the prophet was this incident of Khuraida. And what did he do? He, he made sure to spare the women and children. This is what we're asking you to do. If you, if no one is going against the fact that you want to fight men, you fight them and kill them even. Want to fight our men? 
and kill them, go ahead. No, no man is going to say to you, we have a problem. So we don't even apply double standards here. We're saying men, fine, men on men for killing. No problem. Those combatants, which everyone by the time was armed. Because someone can have a secondary objection and say, well, you guys, you were, you were complaining when all these men were coming out, the Palestinian men with the, the underwear. And you're telling me that anyone that was of age, blah, blah, blah. It's a completely different situation for the following reason. The reason is that because there's 50,000 Hamas fighters, for example, right? 30,000, 50,000, and that. And only those guys have guns. They're, they're combatants, okay? The non-combatants, the ones who are living with their pajamas and living in Khan Yunus and these other places, why are you taking them out of the situation? Everyone was, every man that was capable had a sword. We, you didn't have guns back then. You didn't have machine guns and you didn't have RPGs. So every guy had a sword. That's it. It's common. They had two swords. In fact, they had one sword that they put inside their thing. as like their handy sword, their daily sword. And they had the long sword. So how do you define a combatant? A guy with guns and knives. Yeah, I mean, how do you, how do you define them? Nowadays, we look at the, 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 the uniform. And we say, this person's got a uniform. Must mean he has guns. We will make an assumption in the medieval time that any man above... The age of is an adult, a man. Yes, any man has a weapon. So we killed them. Finish. Finish. What's so controversial about that? No, is the least controversial thing. But anyway, and we, in fact, if they applied the same, if the current uh, state of Israel applied the same thing to uh, what we're seeing here in Gaza, we wouldn't have a problem with them as much. We'll say, Hamas, you, you fought, they fought back, Hamas, finish. They, in fact, they, they, Hamas are saying, come and fight us. They're saying, please, oh, no, I want to fight. Um, be, come, we're, we're waiting for you. Stuff like that. So the, the point is, is that we don't apply a, 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 a double standard here. We, we apply a consistent, honorable standard. And we always have. So can you imagine that the most controversial military thing that they could conjure, that they could find was a situation where combatant men were killed after they were treacherous. And even the Western academics say, yes, they were treacherous. That's the most controversial thing you can find. And they're bombing all these people indiscriminately with drones and weapons and missiles and stuff. And they say, well, your prophet killed the 600 men, male combatants. Yes, in fact, it's that very criticism that you need to look at the most. If you Go ahead and look at his and look at that event. If you copied what he did in that event, you wouldn't really have the problem. People that had the guns and the knives, go fight them. If you copy the Prophet Muhammad, we wouldn't have a problem with you. That's, that's our criticism. If you copy the Prophet Muhammad, we wouldn't have an issue. Well, you have a, you have a problem because you are killing indiscriminately, the killing the babies and the children, women. It's more probable than not you're going to kill them. Anyway, that's the point. So what happened was Safiya bin Tuhayyeh was this woman. Her father was the chief of the tribe, bin Quraida. And her father was Tuhayyeh bin Akhtab. And basically what happened was this. She had a dream, actually, before any of this stuff happened. That basically the, the, the moon would come into her lap and you, all this kind of thing. So she went to him and her father knew how to do tafsir of al-ahlam. He said, uh, basically, that this means that it's going to be a prophet, but it's not going to be from, um, from us. It's going to be from the Arabs. Yeah? And for them, they're tribal people. They, well, what do you mean it's going to be from these guys? And she heard her and the uncle speaking to each other and, and they were speaking to each other. It's like, what, what are you going to do with him? I'm going to go against him for the rest of my life. The father was saying to his brother, so you know it's, there's going to be an Arab prophet, what are you going to do? That's a dream that her, his daughter had. I'm going, to, I'm going to oppose him for the rest of my life. So already you can see there's like a psychological preparation. The daughter, if she has any objectivity in her, which we're assuming that she did have it, she's thinking to herself, okay, well, clearly there's something going on with my dad here. He's, he's more tribal than anything else. He's not after the truth. So that's, she had that dream. Obviously, what happened happened to her father. And he, you know, he was killed and submitted and was humiliated, as he should have been. Did he, did, uh, didn't uh, her husband, I don't know if you just mentioned it, you know when she told this dream, mm. they, they knew who the moon symbolizes, yeah, uh, yeah. and she, she got slapped. Yeah, yeah, the father slapped her, it's a good thing the you mentioned The father or the husband? Father, father slapped her. I heard the husband slapped her. We can double check it, Because sure. Because it symbolized that she's going to marry the prophet or something like that, or something along those lines. We can double check it, but I'm pretty yeah. confident it's the father, but we can double check but what happened was this, so, so now what happened is that Safiya bin Tuhayyeh, she was a very beautiful woman, as you know, we don't kill the women in Islam, we don't kill the children, so what do you do with them? What are you going to do? I mean, think about it, what are you going to do with them? You're going to put them in a big open air prison, 
like what these guys are doing, and create a blockade, and then give them no access to men or anything. They cannot reintegrate, no. Are you going to kill them? No, we don't kill the women and children. So what do they do? They become the prisoner with the man. They become indentured servants. That was the situation of the time. The Prophet Muhammad I came across this one hadith. And this, by the way, uh, when Ali was speaking to his, um, uh, Robinson, it actually came up uh, with Sophia. It was like, Sophia was, what do you call it? Um, he made the point that, you know, the Prophet ﷺ didn't give her a choice, effectively. And he, this is the argument that Robinson made. He was trying to say, it's incredulous that somebody whose father and brother was killed, because that's what happened, her father and brother were killed, right? That she would opt to be with the military leader of that particular battalion. Do you see the argument? And he made a couple of other arguments. And I, I've seen where he gets these arguments from. He gets them from these other... Uh, two-bit Islamophobes who don't do the proper research which is that in fact he didn't even wait and he forced her this is uh, this once again this narrative of forcing which referred to refer to answer a on the matter because we've already said that the Prophet ﷺ gave every one of his wives including Sophia bin Tuhayy the chance not to be with him in the choice so that kills everything by the way yani and we've already spoken about bin Tijon that's number two but we'll come here again. I found this hadith very interesting. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, he says, Ikhtari, choose. Uh, if you choose Islam, I, I will marry you for myself. Yes? And marry, uh, I will uh, hold you to myself and marry you. And if you choose to be a Jew, so listen to this bit. This, uh, the Prophet ﷺ is speaking to Sophia. He says, if you choose to be a Jew, then I will let you go back to your people. I will let you go back to your, your, your tribe. No problem. Yeah. So she said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, I have started to like Islam. I like Islam. And I believe in you. Uh, but, yani, before you even speak, spoke to me about this kind of things, so I don't want to be a Jew anymore. And she says, uh, so basically she's, she's saying that I love Islam and she's all this kind of thing. She, she's, she's changed her mind on the matter, right? Now, she's seen her tribe operate. These are oppressive people, the Banu Quraidah. She's seen like, what, they, what they were doing and their scheming and their this and that. And there was only a few of them in the, there was a few of them who, like this uh, Amr ibn Sa'da and others, weak narrations that came out and said, no, we have a, we have a contract with this man, we, can, we have to honor it. Only a few good men came out. She saw her, the, the, the repugnant and belligerent and treacherous nature of the Banu Quraidah. Why is it so hard to believe it's that a people... Pardon? Banu Nadir. Banu Nadir. She's from Banu Nadir. Huayy bin Akhtab. Oh yes, sorry, Banu Nadir. Right. She, she saw... The treacherous nature of this uh, particular people in Khaybar, right? So then, uh, so then it wasn't her family that was uh, killed in the Banu Quraidah. Not Banu Quraidah. Mm. Huayy bin Akhtab, he joined Banu Quraidah. Yeah, so oh, okay. he was killed yeah. with them, exactly. just his father. But oh, they were right. exiled, okay. her tribe. So yes. the Prophet ﷺ married her in Khaybar. Oh, I see, I see. I so, see. It's a, so let's say her husband... See, that's husband why Sheikh is very important, mashallah. Mm. <laughs> it's good that you said so that, Sheikh. They were, yeah. they were the, uh, the Banu Quraidah that were exiled. Yeah. And then they went Khaybar. Yeah, it was them. Khaybar, yeah. Okay. Okay, that's good to uh, good to know because he was killed with Banu Quraida, right? Ibn Akhtab, the father was killed with Banu Quraida mm -hmm. after Al Ahzab, mm -hmm. and uh, the person that she was wed to him was killed uh, Khaybar later okay. on with the tribe. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So that's where the brother, the the, the husband and the no, father comes the into the equation. Excellent. So the point is, is now she's. It's mentioned in the hadith that she was given the choice. So this disrupts, what does it disrupt? The, the narrative that this was forced. Yeah, he gave her the choice to be a Muslim. The Quran gives you this messaging anyway as well. And you can see what kind of relationship they had. In a very famous narration, uh, basically, you know, some of the wives of the Prophet Muhammad came to her. And she was saying, like, they were being abusive to her based on, the, you know, the fact that she was a Jew. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said to her, but just tell them that, you know, 
uh, we are from the lineage of Aaron. So what was he doing? I mean, if you, if you want to put it in modern parlance, they were doing what people could refer to nowadays as anti-Semitism. Yes? Anti-Semitic remarks. Whatever. So the Prophet told them, look, basically refer to the fact that your lineage is, is a good lineage. So there's nothing that we have against Jewish people on the basis of them being Jewish by ethnic group. This is a very clear indication of that, but it also shows that he was defensive, that he was defending her, that she, he didn't want her to feel like she was an outsider in this society. So you can see the kind of relationship they had together, and it was a good relationship. Why not? So someone could argue now, well, maybe she just had Stockholm Syndrome. I don't know if you've uh, come across this. Now, what is Stockholm Syndrome? Stockholm Syndrome is a psychological response, according to Britannica, wherein a captive begins to identify closely with his or her captors, as well as their agenda and demand. Now, just to stick with this, even if someone says Stockholm Syndrome, for the sake of argument, let's say, yes, fine. She had what was referred to, I'm just saying this for the sake of argument, as Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome doesn't render somebody insane or psychotic. So for the sake of argument, if someone has Stockholm Syndrome, it doesn't mean that they're like on a legal level that their choices or demands or whatever should be disregarded, by the way. Because it's not at the point where it's insanity. Do you see the point? So for example, if someone is diagnosed with Stockholm Syndrome and they decide to change their inheritance to the captor, would that mean in any legal jurisdiction that that person shouldn't have that demand met? No, it wouldn't mean that. Because it doesn't reach the level where you're now psychotic or insane. Now, what is insanity? Insanity is really psychosis. Psychosis is defined by DSM register, the psychological register, as lacking, you're not able to connect with reality. You, you've lost touch with reality. So even the definition of Stockholm Syndrome doesn't reach the threshold of insanity. It still means you're still, you, you are still operating within a paradigm of rationality. It, so, in fact, there's, there is some problematic, you know, nowadays in the left-wing circles, they say, you're gaslighting me. I'm not sure you've heard of this language. You're gaslighting me, which means you're calling me mental. You're calling me crazy. I'm not actually crazy. You're gaslighting me. Okay, well, by calling someone who's making a decision based on what you refer to as Stockholm Syndrome, are you not gaslighting them? That's effectively what you're doing. Because you can use Stockholm Syndrome to create what you refer to as gaslighting. The only time in wh where in which it should be legally or morally justifiable to disregard someone's own autonomous or independent adult decision making is when they are diagnosed with something which is, renders them in a vegetated state, like in a coma, for example, or like extreme Parkinson or something like that, and or in an insane or psychotic state where they've lost touch with reality. This doesn't meet the threshold. So even if you come with that, say, well, she must have had Stockholm Syndrome, for the sake of argument, even if we agree with you, wouldn't you be, quote-unquote, gaslighting her if she made the decision to be with the man based on so-called so Stockholm Syndrome? But even, I said even if, but if we go with this, Stockholm Syndrome, the symptoms that the, pers the person has, it will be rationalizing abuse, distrust, anger towards... We didn't, like, if we really took the Hadith seriously... She doesn't show resentment and anger towards the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In fact, that very hadith we just covered, where she was um, going to the Prophet and complaining about what the other wives are doing. If she felt so angry, why are you complaining? Why are you going to this man for protection? Surely the resentment should stop you from going to this man for the protection against the other wives. So she doesn't show that she is in that resentful state. There's no indication that shows that she's actually resenting this man, Sallallahu In fact, there's another hadith, before, before you come, very famous hadith, where she was walking with the Prophet Muhammad in the street, and some uh, men came, and uh, he, the Prophet Muhammad went to them, and said, this is la Safiya. That certainly she is Safiya. So you can see, even with that hadith, he said, I only told you this because the shaitan runs in the blood of human beings. I only told you this for that reason. But there's two things to note. He wasn't ashamed of having her as a wife, despite her ethnic Jewish heritage. Number two, that he was defensive of her. What you see as a theme with the Prophet ﷺ and Sophia is that he's, comp he's, he's always defending her, whether it's against his own wives, which is the most difficult thing to do, whether it's, whether it's to make sure that the society doesn't consider her to be some kind of an outcast or an alienated figure. So if in all these situations, you see 
that the Prophet Muhammad is acting with her in that way. Um, yes? Just saying that all the hadith that we're going through, they're all sahih, all sound. The ones in the slides and everything. Yes. They're all sound. As far as I know, yeah. I mean, okay. So these are some, some of the case studies that uh, <laughs> you can read in your own time, all right, of people that are diagnosed with Stockholm Syndrome. It's one of the most subjective diagnoses anyone can make, to be, to be honest with you. It's always with these personality disorders, they're always the hardest to diagnose from a psychological perspective because it requires a heavy interpretive scope. It does. It's much easier to diagnose something which has like consistent side effects and or has chemical imbalances or something. But if you're trying to say that this, person's, it, this person is impacted in this way for these reasons, then you're now attributing cause and effect to a personality trait. Once you do that with any, with any of the psychological markers, it becomes very difficult. So their, their attack, their point of attack on Sophia bin Tuhay, as for example, if they do that as a counter-attack on the fact that she has Stockholm Syndrome, or that Aisha has Stockholm Syndrome or whatever, it would be a very weak point of attack. Because then, how do you know she has Stockholm Syndrome? And A, and B, for the sake of argument, even if they did, why would that disqualify them from being able to make decisions? Of uh, choice-based decisions. And number three, even if we say that they do, how comes the symptoms that are associated with Stockholm Syndrome, for example, feeling anger and resentment towards people, are not present in those, in the behaviours of these women? You see, the more and more we investigate the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the more and more we realise that the accusations made against him are actually not only untrue, but they're actually um, vehemently false. And the oppressive nature of how these people misrepresent the Prophet's life. It's unbelievable how they do it. And if someone says, well, you guys are being selective with the hadith you accept. Why we don't accept these hadith? We say to them, so if, you're, if you don't want to accept the hadith, because that's an argument they can say, oh, we don't accept this hadith where he told her to choose, or this hadith or this, that's connected with the ayah. So if you don't accept the hadith, then you might as well chuck all of them out of the bin, in the bin, including the one that says that he married at nine. Yeah. Then you have no. Then you have nothing. Then you have no criticism. Including the history of this. When you, when yeah. No. I mean, if they, for, like, if, as an example, they say, "Well, you just mentioned hadith for the sake of argument of Bintu Jonah, and she was told to go back after she said such and such, and it's in Bukhari, and we're saying it's authentic." We say, they come back and say, "Well, we don't accept your authenticity." We come back to them and say, "Well, if you don't accept the authenticity of Bukhari, then that's the same collection yeah. which has the hadith of nine-year-old." Mm. So if you don't accept this one, you shouldn't accept that one as well. And if you if you don't accept that one, then you have no criticism. What's the thing called you told us about uh, the embarrass? What was the principle of embarrassment. That will become more and more, I, I think we'll bring that in in next session because we said we're going to do two sessions on the marriages of the Prophet vis-a-vis -vis Zayn bin Tajash, which is a, a very important uh, marriage as well. Yeah, yeah and uh, really there's, today we've covered the most controversial. Next lesson, Zayn bin Tajash, and then we're going to go over uh, as well, uh, Jawari bin Tahadith, bin Tahadith and others. And we'll, like the other, we'll bunch them all up. We don't have as much hadith on the others like as we do with Haish. Haish probably, the hadith we have on her is maybe comparable with all the other wives. Com 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 added up together. With that, we will conclude. And hopefully you've learned something. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.